So, good morning, everybody here in the audience and online. Welcome to day six of the Blue Innovation Dock. It's Thursday at Bo Düsseldorf. And we'll start this day with a panel, Transition Pathway of Charter and Marina Sector. And we have seven very interesting guests. And I will welcome them here on stage one by one. Um, we have two ladies. So we start with the ladies for sure. It's Mel Symes, Secretary Trans Europe Marinas. Mel, Melanie, please join me on the stage. She said I should call her Mel. <laughs> so take <laughs> a seat, where's please. Where's 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 this one is mine. Right. The yeah, rest anywhere, is, anywhere. is free for you. Thank you. Um, Ninke Tsetsema, CEO Waterland Monik and Dam. Welcome, Ninke. Then I have Rudi van der Veen. President IWI and Tourism Advocate Director of the City of Ghent. Um, welcome, Rudi. Thank you. Stavros Katsikadis, President of the Greek Marinas Association. Thank you. Welcome, Stavros. Thank you. Karl-Heinz Jungbeck, Tourism President, uh, ADAC. Welcome. Good morning. Morning. You can call me Carl. It's Carl, okay. Thank you. Paul Blanc, Director, Boat Clubs and Brand Director, Jeannot, Beneteau Group. Hello. Good morning, Paul. And Domagoj Milicic, owner and CEO uh, of a Croatian yachting company and board member of the Croatian uh, Chamber yes. of Commerce. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So, there we are. Big panel again. Very good. Thank you all for coming. Nobody has been to the exhibitor party <laughs> last night. Everybody's looking very fresh. Um, the last days uh, we had uh, panels and uh, it's always the best if you describe yourself and your role and why you are here. You can also tell us a little about, uh, about the last days at the boat show if you have been here, no problem. Um, I would start uh, uh, with Nienke, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so my name is Nienke Zetsema, I'm uh, the CEO of Vatel and Monica Dam. Uh, that is a charter company as well as a marina and yacht service located in Monica Dam in the Netherlands. Um, we've been founded by my mom in 1985, so we go way back. Um, we're most known for our charter uh, of dealers, um, Benito yachts as well as J-boats. Um, we have a marina, which is one of the largest in the Isselmeer area. We have over a thousand berths, um, so that's quite a lot. Um, we've been an exhibitor on the trade fair for already quite some years. Um, I was here since Sunday. Love the vibe at the trade fair this year. It's really good to be back um, here in Dusseldorf. And um, yeah, jo I've been an me active member of um, the green uh, Groene Wimpel, as we call it in Dutch, is the green pennant. That's a trademark for sustainable marinas. And I'm an active member of the charter work group. And those two things uh, led to my uh, uh, yeah, presence here today. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Mel? Thank you very much indeed, Marcus. Um, and thanks for inviting me on the panel today. So I come from Trans Europe Marinas. We are a group of 77 marinas across 12 countries in Europe. Ninka is one of our members and exemplary with her uh, green wimple yeah. and a very good environmental program. Um, again, yes, I, I agree. It's a m fantastic show. There's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of energy. And we're very excited about the future. And speaking on behalf of marinas, I think there's a great future for marinas to become much more than they are. So we're having some very interesting conversations, and I look forward to, to moving forward with that. Thank you. OK, yeah, we come back later to this, because the marina is really, I mean, the hub of all this uh, is already about one of my first questions. OK. Um, I have next on my list Rudi. Maybe I don't know if I described your role absolutely correct, but you will explain. Yes. OK, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Rudi van der Veen. I live in the city of Ghent in Flanders, in Belgium. Um, my job is, uh, amongst others, to promote uh, water tourism in the city and also in the broader region. I'm involved in uh, Flanders in some 
networks, all uh, related to water tourism. I'm also a secretary of uh, NOTIF. NOTIF is a Flemish uh, association of uh, marine industry, but uh, related to water tourism, not uh, the big uh, the big industry, but uh, the, the SMEs, etc. Um, and um, I'm here uh, in my role of president of Inland Waterways International. Uh, we bring people together that are interested in uh, the maintenance, the use, conservation, uh, management of uh, inland waterways, canals, etc. Um, so that our uh, public authorities, as well as uh, corporate members, individuals, uh, some museums, uh, we are represented in about uh, uh, 26 countries worldwide, on almost every continent. And um, yeah, we um, like to be here at uh, Boot Düsseldorf. Um, we have normally, on, in normal conditions, our own uh, stand as well. But because of COVID, it's three years ago uh, that we were here, but uh, we are already uh, preparing our presence here for next year. Uh, because our stand is uh, filled with um, uh, people with uh, um, background of uh, waterway authorities, um, like we have in France, Flemish Waterways, uh, uh, Canal and River Trust, b um, bodies like that. So um, that will be, uh, we, we, we always are uh, pre uh, present in the whole uh, 14, because um, we are amongst um, tourism, etc. So. We, we combine uh, promotion, promotion for uh, uh, the rivers, canals, and um, uh, um, the decorum of tourism, in fact. Okay, thank you, Rudy. Um, Stavros? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stavros Katsikadis. I'm the president of the Greek Marine Association. We have 23 marinas in Greece in our association. Personally, I'm the managing director of Lambda Marinas which is part of Lambda Development Group. And we are running two mega yacht marinas in Athens, Flisvos Marina and uh, Elinico Marina, I guess, Cosmas. And we are looking also for new opportunities in Greece. I would like uh, to start by saying congratulations to the organizers of this uh, boot, Messe Düsseldorf, once more. Petros Michelidakis has done a perfect job. We are proud having him, because he is also Greek, <laughs> one of us. And, uh, also to uh, Philippe Steele and European Boating as, uh, uh, Industry for this um, initiative, for the Blue Innovation Doc, which brings us all the professionals together to discuss all the challenges that we are going to face in the next few years. And of course to you, Marcus, and uh, this organization. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. You are the first one mentioning this here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Carl, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Carl Jungberg. I'm the tourism president of the ADAC. First, some words about the ADAC. We are the biggest club in Europe, 22 million members. Uh, we started as an automobile club, but now we call us a mobility club. And of course, boating is a kind of mobility. And we feel responsible for our club members on the roads as well as on the sea. And we run a uh, skipper app. We run a skipper portal and we really take care of our members. In my private business, I'm also connected to the boating industry. I had some clients uh, who were very interested in buying super yachts, so I had the favor or the pleasure to visit some, some of the market leaders and get known to how they sell their boats, what kind of issues are uh, important for them and what are important for the clients. It's quite uh, quite good to know and qu quite good to experience and I'm really looking forward to this panel here and looking forward to the fair at all as this is a really good show I can uh, can just follow the speakers before me and I'm very happy to be here thank you thank you for coming uh, Paul uh, good morning everyone so my name is Paul Blanc I work for the the Benito group um, I have actually two roles within the Benito Group. One is to be the brand director of uh, Jano, and another hat that I have, and I think that's, that's what I can contribute here, is that I also lead the development of Boat Club uh, within a, a division of the Benito Group, which is Boating Solutions. Uh, we are a bit 
both manufacturer, but we are also actively investing in the uh, development of services because obviously the, the economy is changing uh, and the uh, landscape is changing. And so we are also uh, exploring the path of uh, charter, uh, boat clubs and, and shared economy in general. So this is part of so uh, an answer to the sustainability. Um, we obviously uh, a big sponsor for this Blue Innovation Dock initiative because we really believe uh, in the need for this transition. And so we are very happy to, to contribute. And, um, <coughs> and so th thanks for animating and organizing. I really like this topic uh, myself of the, uh, the, the transition of charter and marinas because it's actually quite rare that we have this opportunity to exchange between a boat manufacturer, uh, 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 an infrastructure owner, and, uh, and an operator like a charter company because at the end of the day, there is a, a user in the middle and we need to all come together uh, offering the right product and service and, and, and do the right thing to transition to more sustainability. So. I'm sure we'll have uh, interesting conversations, but thanks for having me. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for coming. Domagoj? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Domagoj Milicic. I'm founder and uh, director of Croatia Yachting. Uh, we are a charter company uh, managing 140 boats in Croatia in five different locations, actually, along the coast. Also, we are boat dealer and representing big, major, uh, big international players sailboats, catamarans, and motorists in Croatia. So yes, of course, I'm once again, thank you for organizer, for having me here. Also to open this topic and to talk about transition, of course, it's already started, but I think uh, we have a lot of things to improve and I think speed up and of course, to share all these ideas among all the players in the market. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the last days, I learned a lot already uh, here on stage because uh, we had so many experts. Um, what I learned, a boat in, in, in Europe is, has around 50 engine hours per year, roughly. So, uh, Paul, is the, is the boat or the, is the marina more important? Because most of the time the, <laughs> the boat is in the marina. But, uh, and one um, of your brands, uh, Delphia, is going all electric and that is really my first question to you. Are we already prepared for this kind of initiative or what is lacking? Because you have so many marina operators here, you can address it right now. Uh, I think we have very, very different profiles of boat users. So there's not one answer for everyone. Uh, but definitely we see the, I mean, you touched the point of the, the sharing economy, which on land is already moving very fast. You start today to share your cars, to share your bikes, to share your holiday flat. Uh, and actually it makes even more sense on the water because the infrastructure is actually even more limited. And so <coughs> there's only so much space for a certain number of boats. And as you say, in average, they are used 50 hours per year. Not all of them, some are intensely used and some are almost never used. So of course, it raised the question of how can we optimize the asset and infrastructure to put more people in the water and get these boats shared between different users. So I think it's today very mature for small day boats uh, because it's a pretty standard product. The, it's a platform to enjoy time with your friends. So a small day boat can easily be shared between different people. It's harder when you get to bigger boats where owners are more passionate. They have something that they want to have a boat that really looks like them with their own decoration. So it will take more time, I think, on the upper segments of the market. But uh, I think at the end, it's, um, it's also a matter of the economical model. Uh, it, it can be profitable today to have a day boat rental business or a boat club. It's hard to do it on a, on a luxury yacht. So the model on luxury yacht is that you would own a luxury yacht and maybe charter it just to amortize some of your costs, but it's not going to be a profitable business in itself. Uh, there's another solution with sailboats, which is weekly charter, and this probably is the oldest sharing a company model in the, in the boating business is the, the weekly rental of sailboats. So there are a lot of different answers to different type of products and different markets, but definitely the transition is there and we see it. 
Um, and and uh, the challenge is how we can indeed, uh, for some of the boats, share the boats more between different members and design, design products that... Uh, it's dangerous here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, it's only water. So, so. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes, but if yes. I, if Mayor? I could add to that, um, I think really we have to take a big step back in marinas in terms of the infrastructure. If marinas are going to be able to attract the funding that they need to be able to engender the green transition and the digital transition, and we were talking about in an awful lot of money to be able to replace grey infrastructure with multifunctional green infrastructure, which is biodiversity friendly. We're talking about bringing in you know, smart systems, digital services, um, everything in between to be able to get ready for what's coming. I mean, we know what's coming. We've had a lot of data over the last few days about you know, the different types of boats which are going to be um, which are going to have you know, the, this new renewable, sorry. Dri no, no, driven by young customers. Um, Possibly, but if we want young customers, we need to practice some positive discrimination and not just young customers, but we need to change the, the gender arena. I mean, come on. You know, I've, been, I've been in meetings over the last few days. Women represent perhaps 10%. So, so let's look at gender identities and find out what's going wrong there. How are we representing the sector in a way that we need to bring in you know, more genders, more, di more ages, make it far more inclusive and more accessible? Yeah. And uh, we had uh, yesterday someone from the uh, EU and European Commission. There are four different programs. I mean, but I said, okay, is it easy to find? Hmm. So uh, there are different programs where you can get fundings for your marina. Yeah? But, um, but sorry to, to interrupt you. <laughs> to, to be able to do that, marinas need to matter from a socioeconomic perspective. I mean, it's all very well and good, you know, doing what they're doing so far, but they need to change. There needs to be a transition towards all of these more responsible government governance procedures. <coughs> Staff was, uh, I take a sip of water. Is that correct? The marina has to change or uh, who has to change? Well, the marina uh, owners and the investors will decide finally what to do. <coughs> but if they don't change, if they don't adapt, uh, we have realized that the marina uh, value will be downgraded. And sooner yeah. or later, what is coming from EU, and we will start with Europe and the States prob probably, uh, will be that it will not be possible to get a, a loan yeah. to, uh, to invest or to, to, to pass any kind of audit or uh, if you are a listed company, you're finished. So uh, the EU has already published regulations and requirements starting not in 10 years, but starting in 2025. We have 2023, so in two years, and I repeat that, in less than two years, it will be required from big companies or companies listed or companies with security uh, connected with banking yeah. system and shareholders mm -hmm to publish their sustainability information and incorporate in their management report. This, that means that for marinas who, are, who have shareholders, bigger companies or large companies, and the majority of, this, uh, of, the, of the shares of the marina belongs to uh, big companies or listed companies, they should have started the change yesterday. Otherwise, the sustainability information, the recordance, the data collected uh, to publish uh, in 2025 the first sustainability information will be very hard or uh, even impossible. And I'm telling that having the experience of Flisos Marina. Flisos Marina, uh, I'm proud that we were the winners of Monaco Forum Smart and Sustainable Marinas. Uh, why? Not because we decided because of the changes, but we had this culture coming back six and seven years ago, included in our strategy. Not because somebody told us, but because it was, let's say, our, our, our culture in the company. So whatever quality management system exists in the marinas need to adapt, need to be more uh, systematic and professional with uh, people educated and trained 
and do uh, the change uh, immediately. This is the message. This is what we, we came here today to share with our uh, colleagues and marina operators all, all over the world. Yes, Kai, one, one day. Yeah, I just want to emphasize what you said. It's not, but it's not just for stock noted companies that you will get, get no funding anymore. It's also for small companies if you need money from the banks. The green taxation policy of the European Community is very strict and in two, three years you won't get any money for any investments if you cannot prove that you, uh, that you have your sustainability program. So it's, I, don't, I don't know if everybody has already realized it, I but it's, so. it's, it's a really hard stuff what's coming from Europe and I think we all should be aware that uh, sustainability integration into the companies is really a key issue. And concerning the funding, it's, it's good that we have so many European partners on the panel. But for Germany, the European funding is a mess because we are not ready for it, for the European programs. This is why Croatia or Greece are getting hundreds of millions from the European um, uh, Commission and the European community. But it's very hard to get the same funding for, for German companies. Our uh, political infrastructure is not ready for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is very general. This is, but more in detail, um, what is the problem at the moment? For example, um, we don't have a, a centralized tourism ministry. Croatia has one. And Greece. They are, and Greece has one too. They are going to Brussels, they are dealing, and they, they are bringing together all the, the votes they need. We don't have it, and we do, we do not have the same um, uh, lobby group from the Ministry of, Econo of Economy. And the Ministry of Economy is not so interested in, in water streets or in marinas in Germany. It's not a key business. We go for the automobile industry, but not for the for water sport industry. And this is our dis disadvantage we have here. Okay, and maybe I'd like to bring in your two, because this 25, I was not really aware. Are you prepared? Yes, for sure. Yeah, well, um, I believe if I, I was not aware of this um, regulation coming into place, but I do find it very logical because we've all been asked two or three years ago for our power consumption and the, um, uh, 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 because we as a harbor use a lot of power and uh, we need to make sure that um, we use, it as, use energy as most efficiently as possible so that we don't have um, um, yeah, that we can save where we can. So we have solar panels and, and, and LED lights and, and we needed to have that reported. So if I, I find it very logical that if you want to uh, uh, get more fu funding, that it has a goal that it's been thought through because we don't otherwise, um, there are some decisions you cannot make anymore. Mm -hmm. You know that now, I cannot, if I want new, um, uh, we need whole new jetties. I can't get like hardwood from somewhere 2.2 kilometers of hardwood. I cannot sell that to my customers that a whole forest needed to be cut down because we would like the wood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So yeah, I see, I see why um, this, I, I think it's a logical step. And, and no, some companies are not ready. But we also need to ask ourselves, will they ever be? Yeah, correct. Uh, Rudi, do you? <coughs> yes, um, yeah. I don't know if you invited during the past days somebody of uh, the PIANC organization. Um, PIANC is the uh, World Association of Waterway uh, Managers and mm -hmm. Engineers, as well from public authorities as uh, private uh, companies. Um, but I'm chairing um, a working group of PIANC. Um, about um, we, we try to uh, make uh, guidelines for inland waterways infrastructures to facilitate tourism. So that involves also the, the marinas, etc. Uh, we don't look at the European scale, but worldwide. So I have a lot of discussions for the moment um, because at the end of 2023, the um, the guidelines should be uh, published. Um, and now uh, I'm. Um, most uh, involved in discussions with uh, academics, with the uh, professors uh, worldwide from the states, from uh, Africa, from Egypt, uh, for example. Uh, they are very uh, interested in participating and 
uh, giving us information how they see it, etc. I think in the, the whole discussion we need to, to listen more to also to the academ academic world or um, listen to their ideas how they could help the industry and also uh, politics um, for yeah, coming to a, a united vision um, and not country per country or continent per continent because I think that's uh, um, a very important uh, point of view that we have a global uh, system, a global vision and that is what uh, is lacking in, in Europe as well. If I look to Belgium for example, we don't have one minist ministry of tourism, we have three because you have Flanders, you have Wallonia, and you have Brussels. So we, we never discuss with, with each other, so we are also nowhere. We can't go um, with the region to Europe for ask for money for a project. If it's not a country, then you can't start the discussion. So we are in the same situation uh, again. Yeah, and Domagoj, um, in Croatia, you have this tourism uh, yes. minister, and you have the funding, and you, you told me you... Um, are trying to establish a, a marina. Can you describe a bit uh, how exhausting this is? Um. Okay, so uh, I have to correct colleagues. So first, the European funds, non-refundable funds, are not available to build marina first because they are built on public, let's say, uh, land or I mean under the concessions. So no asset, real asset, you can use as, it, as that. So, but of course, yes, there are some programs and we are trying to actually to manage to get some, some funds maybe to use it at, for this transition we are talking about, of course. So starting from the boats or marinas itself. So Adriatic is very small and closed uh, environment. And of course, we have to protect it as soon as possible. Otherwise, we will lose our biggest asset we have actually, and that's tourism. Fortunately or unfortunately, we have only tourism in Croatia. That's why we don't have Volkswagen, for example. But um, so it's good or not. Yes, and that's why we have Ministry of Tourism. But uh, still, um, they are not see actually uh, need to support uh, marinas in these, uh, let's say, funds because everyone is considering that marina business is very profitable, although, although it's not actually, it's a very long-term business, same as a boat, uh, boat charter as well, uh, but especially marinas. But we are connected together, as long as we have enough marinas, we will have enough boat or vice versa, and we are actually having big problem because we have a, a lack of marina birds in Croatia, or mostly they are not distributed equally along the coast. So, for example, you have very loaded infrastructure on some places, for example, around the split, which is maybe 40% of capacity, while other areas are not developed. And of course, that's something which should be better re distributed. But procedure of getting, uh, let's say, building permits and, uh, and uh, environment uh, affection study and such things takes too long and many investors actually gave up idea to build marina because usually that's really too complex now. But uh, from the other point of view, I would go back to your previous question regarding usage of the boat. So uh, Paul mentioned that, uh, let's say, we were talking about 50 hours per year of the private boat. In charter, if you count that actually boats are used maybe 500 hours per year, but still you have to divide it to number of persons, let's say 20 week, which is average number of weeks, divided with six persons, let's say average per boat, that's something which is, let's, let's say, less affecting environment because if you divide it, you will get that this boat is used much, much less per person per year than one private boat. And actually, that's why Charter is the leader and pioneer in this sharing economy and, yes. uh, and environment friendly, of course. You have a Charter company, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are talking the whole week about sustainable <laughs> boating. I mean, there's a lot to come. And I learned a lot about biodiesel and e-fuels and charging st stations and so on and so on. Um, so what I want to know is, is the customer ready to uh, travel sustainable? Is he really interested or is it like, okay, we 
is talking, yeah, but um, maybe the ADAC, Carl, you have, uh, I mean, so many members, um, and you do um, reports and so on. What is your impression? Is it, is it really coming, driven by young customers or even by all generations? First of all, I have to mention that the ADAC is supporting every initiative for the transition pathway into sustainability. I think it's necessary, it's important, but uh, to be honest, we do have own polling systems, especially also for water sports and for uh, the, the water mobility. And what we see is, what we see in every poll you do, you have answers from uh, the clients which are maybe not close to reality, but which are going into a direction what, the, what they think they are expected to answer. Let's say it very carefully. So there is an opinion that it's important, of course, but when, when it's coming to, um, to paying it, or it's, when it's coming to doing it, it's, it's different. So only 10% are ready to do it, but over 50% are saying it's important. I think this is a gap which, which is uh, uh, all, all over the businesses and which is uh, very typical for the tourism industry. People want to, to, uh, to act <laughs> sustainable, but if it's coming to pay a bit more for it, then they say no. And um, this we have to overcome. So this is the reality, but we have to start it. It's important. And the ADAC is ready to start it but I think we, have, uh, we, we will have for uh, quite a long time the fuel engines on the boats yeah. and not only the electric engines. You say some maybe for the round, if, if you operate a marina or, if you're in, or if even for Paul, do you see there are more sustainable solutions? Are customers asking, okay, where is your energy coming from, et cetera, et cetera? Or is it like 20 years ago? And this is all theoretical stuff no. we are talking about. Yeah, for, for us, we've, because we are a member of the... Uh, there is, there's a, the Green Key, I guess you all know the certification system, the Green Key yeah. uh, International. Uh, the Dutch one has one especially for harbors. So that's the green pennant. And we were one of the first to make the next step. So we're, well, we take the extra step, we take the extra mile, meaning we've been... Um, we can only have the green pennant if we have um, the most uh, sustainable energy contract available. So I don't have the cheapest one, but I have the most sustainable one. Um, we sell biofuel, so we have biofuel statements for blue diesel, for the boats we have. Um, and I do believe, and we have a, a, a corporate sustainability report, to show which initiative we do, how we reuse um, the, the, the boating as we experience it, um, is already quite efficient when it comes to the use of resources. Lots and lots can be reused again. So we have, uh, like for the waste uh, that Harbor has, we have different like every type of waste is collected by itself. So we have like cans with aluminum, cans with glass, cans with old lines. All this will be shredded into new lines, into new aluminum. And to so those, source, those um, um, are really initiatives that, can, that make a difference. So our clients know that they can choose the harbor because we, are, we do that. We find it important because this, this is us now but it will be generations and generations more because diesel engines will be at in harbors for the next 20 to 50 years. Yes. It will not be electrical. Yep. So what can we do? Yeah, m m make sure that, because what you can change is normal diesel. Don't sell it anymore in the harbor. Make it biodiesel. Yes. Correct, yes, but Carl wanted to add. Yes, I have to talk. Uh, in favor of the German marinas, because these bio, uh, uh, biofuels, what in, uh, which are already available in the Netherlands, are not available in Germany, they are forbidden in Germany. And uh, now the, the German government won't, won't even forbid the biodiesel, diesel, uh, the gasoline. 
So we really, as ADAC, we are fighting that we get the allowance to, uh, to run engines and, uh, on, the, on the water on, and on the roads with these um, biofuels. It's very important because, as, you, as you, you said, for the next 25, 30 years, we will have the engines on the roads and on the water. So we have to enable our club members and <coughs> millions, I think it's in Germany, we have 40 million cars run with uh, burning engines. So we have to provide some fuels for these cars and for the boats as well. What's the reason they do not allow? Uh, we have a green, I think we have a green, no, I know that we have a green government. And I think this is because they are very restrictive on this uh, uh, level. Can I ask a question on that? Is yes, red diesel still available here? Um, we, we have to the add blue diesel, yes? Yeah, but, but for boats, there used to be red diesel. It's forbidden in the Netherlands, and you could get it in Belgium and in Germany. I think you can still get it, but there is an in initiative also to forbid it on, the, on that level, yes. Yeah. And uh, in, in Greece, Stavros, is there, uh, is there a trend towards sustainability, to new fuels, to etc.? I, I will tell you my, my opinion, Marcos. Um, First, we, we need to separate the long-term targets mm -hmm. Good idea. and what we do today for the marinas. I mean, I'm speaking for the marina sector. Uh, the marinas do, don't have the time um, to, to wait for the politicians or the Ministry of Tourism or for the long uh, visions of uh, European uh, Union. The marinas need to adapt immediately on practical daily operating issues related to waste management, to green issues in the marina, and all the marina managers and operators know exactly what to do because they are experienced. So we need to start immediately changing the culture and the quality management system in the marinas, immediately. Uh, regardless what the European Union will decide finally, regardless what will be the, the, the dominant uh, fuel uh, uh, or method of uh, propulsion for the boats. First of all, we should, uh, I want to pass the message and, uh, for, to the marina operators. And the second thing is yes, it will take time, it will take years to decide if hydrogen will dominate the market and the method to produce hi hydrogen. The, all, these, all these products will be related to the production cost, the cost of the production. And this will take time to, to finalize, to decide. And uh, even more time will take the conversion, the, the, to transfer from the diesel engines, if we transfer finally, or if we convert finally the boats uh, having the internal combustion engines to another type. So, we, but we cannot wait, because if we wait because of the makers and the costing issues, then we will uh, lose the game. The, our environment will be destroyed, will be much worse, and we will stay out of business. We will not have any yachting industry because uh, the boating will be downgraded. Nobody will want to travel and enjoy his boat in clean uh, water and safe environment. So the, uh, let's separate these two issues. What we do today, and what is, uh, are the regulations and, uh, uh, that will finalize? This is the message I want to pass. Yeah, good very point. good, thank you. Mel, you... Yeah, it's, it's a very strong message. And I think that um, there's another thing. I mean, all these discussions, we seem to be making sustainability synonymous with energy change, but there is so much more. I mean, everything else seems to be left behind. And I think one of the problems is there's a lack of capacity building in marina staff and in boating industry staff to recognize the wider problems. So why aren't marinas, um, in the same way that we looked at adjacent industries, to look at you know, the, the transition of the propulsion situation? Why aren't we looking at building alliances with academics, with research companies, with um, schools, colleges, bringing in youth, looking out and seeing how we can learn a bit more about our local natural capital and how individuals can protect it and how marinas can educate their boaters by showing them the way forward. And who could start this? Who has the head? You know, who is leading all this? Well, if, if well, the industry, I think, reaching out, I know, I think there's a, there's a lot of interest from what I see. There's a lot of interest. Paul, yeah? No, I, I think there's a big 
push from the industry to, to do that transition? I mean, we're speaking about getting fundings to accompany that transition, but in, in, as boat builders, we don't have funding to make greener boats. We do it because we have to, but also because we want to. And I think when you look at this boat show, you, you see that it's impressive how many solutions are today offered on the market. And I agree they, they come expensive, and whether the clients are ready to pay for the extra price True. is another question, but it's always been like that. Any transition at the beginning, technology is expensive, and then it becomes more affordable. But what we see is that uh, our clients want it as well. Uh, why? Because when you're fortunate enough to go boating, you feel a sense of responsibility, and we see our clients coming more and more to us saying, okay, I've sold my company, I'm very fortunate, I want to buy a boat, but I want to do it with a sense of responsibility. And, and they start to be able to m put a little bit more money, and they really consider what we do ourselves to make the boats uh, more green. And another thing that's very important is that usually when you buy a boat, you buy it as a family. And the younger generations, they're not the ones signing a check, but they put a lot of pressure on the parents to make the right choice. And so, uh, it is definitely a marketing argument today, but we also do it because we want uh, to accompany that transition. And I think we are an industry where we're all nature lovers. I mean, we work in the business also because we love that environment. And so we, we, we are all going for it. And I think it's changing fast. And so, of course, after the infrastructure needs to uh, adapt and it's not going to change like that, I agree that diesel engines are going to be around for a long time because we need to have a smooth and slow transition, but we need to integrate slowly the, the new solutions. But as a, as a big group, Jano Beneteau, um, what is the propulsion system of the future? I mean, with one brand, you're going all electric. Um. So yes, again, the, the solutions are very uh, diverse. Uh, river boats, we are already moving towards 100% electric because displacement speed we can do it. Uh, sailboats, we can have electric engines and sailboats. I mean, the sailboat is already a hybrid propulsion by itself. Uh, so we push also sailboats more. Uh, and we see a, a regain of interest for sailing uh, since the last three years. I think it's partly due to the fact that it's a greener boat than a power boat. <coughs> um, and then we, we will have for boats that at planing speed, we start to have outboard uh, electric engines for small boats with power up to 180 horsepower that can give you a range of two, three hours of use. So that starts to be interesting for day boating, rental companies. Uh, and then for bigger boats, we start to have hybrid systems uh, where at least when you get closer to the shore, you switch to electric mode. And so it's going to develop, the, the, there are a lot of different solutions, but they are real, and uh, we start to integrate progressively in our different offers. Carl, you have a, a little bit outside view on this industry. What do you see in terms of sustainability? Is it, and even compared to the car business probably, is this enough, is it fast enough, or is it? Uh, for sure, for the environment, it's not fast enough. So we, I really have to agree, we have to start now. But I think uh, we have to be realistic for the industry side and for the client side. And it has to be affordable. It has to be, um, from the scientific side, it has to be reachable. I think we have some targets which are not reachable, not in the time and maybe not at all, if we, especially if we see on the car side. But anyway, I think you have to have very, um, very strong targets that you reach at least what is possible. I think this is the way we have to think and we have to start now. But for sure, um, it, I'm not so optimistic that, that we can keep the timeline, but we have to start now. And I'm fully, I fully agree what you uh, told us in th at the beginning. The argumentation that uh, a boat is used 50, 50 hours per year, and this is no, not so much consumption if you break it down to the clients. The same argumentation we have in the supercar industry. Uh, Horatio Pagani, for example, the great Italian car maker, was telling me my clients go for 500 kilometers with their car. The rest of the time, 
they are uh, polishing the car, they're admiring the car, but they don't run it. So the consumption of CO, uh, CO2 is very low, even if you, if you, if you uh, count it per 100 kilometers, it's quite high at uh, a percentage. But in, re in, in reality, it's quite low. And um, as we have also in the car industry, you have a car industry in Croatia, you have <laughs> even with yes. Rimac, you have a, a, a big owner of Porsche, <laughs> for example, <laughs> but they are fully electric. So I think it's, it will be the combination. Uh, what we have to see and we have to start now. That's it. Yeah, and uh, it, don't worry, right, right. Also, car, correct, yes, Remark, Bugatti, I think, as well. Right? Bugatti, yeah, no, this yes. is Remark. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And um, it was a, a share deal but with Porsche. If, if, if <laughs> it comes to number of the units, then it's <laughs> of everything obvious. <laughs> so we are talking about 100, not Yes, no, no, millions. but you have a charter clients, and um, you, are they asking, even if they are younger, I want to do this generation uh, um, topic a little bit, are they asking for new solutions and how to book and how to reserve, you know, the all digital and... So, first, yes, of course, there is interest, of course, but still depends on price, of course. So people are more aware about our environment and, of course, and somehow that's the nature of the sailors also because they are all connected to the uh, nature and that's why they are more aware about it. But still, of course, as long as it is somehow affordable, so they will pay more, but of course not much more. Also, I think this is a long-term process if we talk about, let's say, transition and when it comes to uh, uh, fuel. So for sure, that's a long, long term and it has to first be technology which is affordable and then, of course, to adopt to that technology all the industries. So I think we will not give any answer or there is no one answer. But from other point of view, all here, actually players, of course, we can step by step do also transition. I mean, when it comes, for example, to my business, uh, charter business or marinas, first we need, let's say, uh, pumps to suck out the uh, uh, black water tanks. We don't have that infrastructure. That's something what we need to develop. And uh, actually, they are starting already some programs in Croatia to resolve that actually problem. That's a big problem. Uh, black water tanks, for example. Also, we are trying and we are already adopting to, let's say, environment-friendly chemicals using for the washing boats. So that's something we can do now. Of course, we cannot change the engine now as long as technology is not available. Paul have to provide it. <laughs> but of course, once it's available, uh, we would be free, uh, uh, happy actually to adopt that because clients are ready and they're asking, especially as you said, younger populations, they are more aware of the, of the uh, environment, probably because that's a hot topic now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, these young guys uh, or more uh, girls are doing a, a good job when I think about Sweden. Um, no, that's okay. But uh, Star Wars, yeah, you said action now. What can be done? Like these examples, okay, black water tanks. Um. Yes. Yeah, there, uh, there are so many practical uh, daily things. Uh, waste management is one that we should focus <coughs> because this is the main, let's say, um, main obligation in ma when we manage a marina, we operate a marina. The daily waste management should include everything chemicals, uh, oil, water, um, uh, whatever is disposed or produced from the boating. So the, the, the regulation will come and will ask the operator of the marina and will say that you are responsible, because they already say, but it will become stricter. They say you are responsible for whatever. You are the producer of this waste. So you need to cooperate also I will tell you something about the targets uh, which are coming. 2030, gas emissions from, uh, and it will include marinas, and the small marinas also, should be reduced 30% compared to 2019. Many marinas mo don't have a, even any data, any kind of data to, 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 to uh, achieve the target. So that's why we are saying that we should change our management system and start measuring and use consultants, especially to start uh, calculating according to the ISO standards what we are doing in the marina. Direct emissions concern whatever we do with our people to manage the marina. Indirect emissions because it is a marina and we need energy. And this energy means 
uh, emissions, gas emissions, because the energy is not clean, is not yet clean, coming from somewhere. And there are also other measures coming, other indirect, meaning supply chain. It will go to the supply chain. If you buy, let's say, chains from China, the factory producing the chains in China, are they, do they follow EEG principles? Then you, in, in the European marina, operating the marina, you will be responsible for your choice to buy from where to buy to supply uh, your chains or your diver actions or whatever. So let's start because it will not be easy. Yes, God, yeah. And it I will see. all be controlled by the green tax taxation systems, which means by That's financial instruments. With penalties also. With penalties, you don't get the funding, not, not official EU funding, but also financial market funding, direct by banks or by stock investors. You won't get anything if you do not follow these principles. And this is the big challenge for all the big companies and the small companies. Yes, Paul, yeah, you, very sad. No, because we're speaking about the life cycle also and, and where you purchase your equipment. And it's when we analyze our impact on the environment, we, we look at the whole life cycle. And, and so, uh, of course, there's a usage and, and what impacts the infrastructure, what you can offer uh, also is contributing to that. But of course, for us, it's, it's our purchasing strategy. Where do we buy our components? Uh, the manufacturing of the boat, of course. All the usage of the boat and what we do at the end of the life of the boat to uh, discontract this boat. And so we're working on these four uh, main criteria. It's quite hard to measure because, of course, the usage of the boat can vary a lot. But we expect that each of these four steps is about 25% of the impact of the boat. So the usage itself is only a quarter of the whole impact. And so that's why we are also working at manufacturers to reduce the footprint of the manufacturing. We invest a lot in uh, recyclable resin so that we can recycle the boat at the end of its life. Um, but that's why I want to bring the subject of sharing economy because it's when you see that there is an overall impact of the whole boat, including 75% that's outside <coughs> the usage, when you optimize the usage of that boat between different people, you greatly reduce the impact. And so that's why the sharing economy is, is, is one thing that concerns the infrastructure and the marinas that also has an impact, I think, on sustainability. And so uh, I have a bit of a question to my colleagues who are in the marina business, but how do you integrate today uh, the, the boat club and the sharing economy model in your infrastructure? Because I think that's going to be one of the answers tomorrow. <coughs> yes, please. I mean, whoever... Um, yeah, so um, it's, it's really good to see that we now have groups of friends buying boats, but we have like practical um, setbacks on that level because we have a contract with one person, not with three. So the boat has an insurance, but with one person. So you see that there are some like uh, important parts of the share economy that can't be shared because the boat is a boat and it belongs to one person. And uh, so, so there uh, is still some, some, some things to be done. But we do see, we always have a, a rule of thumb saying, um, because we, you can also charter, uh, we charter boats, um, if you use the boat more than five weeks a year, you need to have one. Everything less, you need to rent. Charter, uh, uh, go out with friends, uh, liaise. Um, and the other thing is, well, COVID did trigger that a lot more recently. Everybody who had a minor interest in boating bought a boat. And that was something that we've, c if we had this set up in the 2020 um, uh, boat show, we would have never guessed mm. that that would happen. So, yeah, for sharing, it's an important part, uh, but we still need to cater for some, yeah, um, like legal structures on that hand. Yes, any... Yeah, yeah I, I, sharing economy is, uh, is the purpose. I mean, yachting, uh, marinas is the critical, marinas are the critical infrastructure to have yachting. 
so uh, of course we share uh, all the the, 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 the value and uh, the benefits and the, the or in the yachting industry but also we have you have to continue to maintain some principles let's say the free competition you have chartered you have uh, private sector you have so the marinas uh, need to, to adapt all the time but this is the commercial part mm -hmm. uh, there are some critical issues for the marinas and I'm sharing with uh, my colleagues here in, uh, in Düsseldorf also. Let's say the concession end period. There's a big discussion, huge discussion in Europe now because there are uh, uh, long investments, 30, 40 years, <coughs> uh, huge investments with upfront payments, uh, millions to, 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 to build a marina and then uh, uh, now uh, reaching at the end of the concession in let's say three, five, ten years you need to decide how we are going to upgrade our infrastructure because of ESG requirements. So why somebody who will leave the marina and it goes back to the government would reinvest some millions to adapt with ESG criteria since he will not have the marina in three or five years? There's a huge discussion. So, uh, but, but as I said, we cannot wait for the governments or the, 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 the European committees to, 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 to prepare the legislation. Practical issues that we have to adapt. Uh, water management, which is also a critical, uh, apart from waste management, water management. Water is the, the big trouble, the big problem coming uh, in our world. So uh, rainwater collections, filtering the water, using the water with our uh, high high value uh, boats and mega yachts. Um, th these are practical issues that we need to, to uh, change and uh, and uh, adapt with ESG and protection of the environment values. Um, uh, and the design issues, the climate change, huge issue. Climate change, why it has a direct impact in our marinas? Because it, the good scenario is that in 2050, the level of the water, the seawater level, will rise up 30 centimeters. So somebody will say 30 centimeters is not so much. It is, it is too much because if you have uh, fixed pontoons or fixed piers in the, in the quays in the marina, it will not be possible for the ladders of the boats to, to, to adapt yeah. or to change. So uh, and, and there is the worst case scenario that it will be 80 centimeters. This will take out of the market many marinas today. So uh, the, des the designers uh, in the marinas and they need today to adapt and uh, adapt the design and the, the standards and the criteria for the marinas. But this, as I said, let's start with EAG requirements and the day-to-day -day operations in the marinas. Yes, thank you. But uh, you are uh, operating, you know, marina uh, associations, big marinas, etc. I'm thinking about a marina which is just 30, 40 boats and is absolutely not informed about all this was coming. Is it necessary for these people to be in an association, to be in a, well? Um, well, an association can offer so much, can't it? I mean, you know, economically, where everyone is fighting now against the bigger chains that have, you know, far more industrialized processes and can offer so many more advantages. Yes, I mean, our, in our group, our association was born of the smaller and independent marinas clubbing together. And it has since grown based on sharing good practice, having discussions like this, um, coming together, and, and a very, very, very simple procedure. But I mean, I absolutely agree with Stavros. Um, but th I think it's a combination. It's not just putting the ball in the court of the customer and expecting the customer to, to sort of um, get on with it by himself. The marinas have to provide solutions. But I think Stavros's marina is probably an exemplary, you know, example of, of what's going on here because he really, he really is one of the forefront in terms of sustainable development. Um, but it is about, you know, if we want to move forwards, if marinas want to represent themselves correctly. Um, have this impact on the world around them, they need to develop, they need to grow alliances. You know, what we're talking about resilience. Resilience is not something a marina can manage by themselves. They need know-how from outside. We need to reach out, connect with groups around us and make marinas, more than marinas, but marine centers. Mm. Thank you very much. I think that's a good statement, <laughs> a final statement. No, really, yes. Thank you all very much for coming. It was very interesting. And um, yes, have a good show ahead. <laughs>